So we've got a phosphorus problem. And one of the reasons is this. This is a tale of the link between matches, dehydrated pee and your bones. Of the birth of the British labor movement and the first trade unions, global wars over bird poo, and ultimately how this single element has helped double the world's population. But also how our unhealthy addiction to it may just cause a particularly bleak future where we can't produce any food. The issue with phosphorus is if we don't do something about it now, the future that we leave our children and our grandchildren uh, is looking bleak. Grim. But we're not there yet. So how did we get here? The first thing to know about phosphorus is that it's a finite resource. What we've got left on Earth is all we've got. And phosphorus is very rare in the universe. This precious element is made only in some stars, with the majority of it coming when bigger stars explode in a supernova, scattering this newly formed phosphorus throughout the universe. But we're lucky to have any phosphorus at all. Not all stars create phosphorus, and some say that this rarity might be why alien life remains so elusive. Why? Because phosphorus is essential to life as we know it. Of the six key building blocks for life, phosphorus is the rarest. So much so that it led the great writer and chemist Isaac Asimov to call it life's bottleneck. Phosphorus is actually the unsung hero um, in all life itself. And our bodies actually have more than half a kilo of phosphorus um, in them, predominantly in our bones, but also in our very DNA and our RNA and our cell walls. And phosphorus is also responsible for um, transmitting energy to our brains. Humans and animals get all our phosphorus from the food we eat and plants get it from the soil after we've, well, got rid of it. Eat poop grow, repeat. A virtuous cycle, basically since the dawn of human civilization, and way beyond that. For more than 5,000 years, um, in China and other parts of Asia, they've been recycling phosphorus in human excreta back to agricultural soils known as night soil. And even in um, first century, in the Middle East, the Romans were using um, pigeons, not only for their meat, but for their um, nutrient-rich manures. <laughs> Part of the reason why we have a population of um, over 7 billion today is because of our use of, of phosphorus and other nutrients to boost crop yields. Modern day farming is reliant on huge quantities of phosphorus rich fertilizer. But scientists think we're gonna run out of phosphorus within the next few decades. At some point, demand will exceed supply and that's when you have this critical crunch time. And certainly our research has showed that that's likely to occur this century, possibly around 2070. So how did we get here? What happened to this virtuous cycle of eat, poop, repeat? Well, like all good stories of humans messing with nature's cycle, it starts when we first discovered it, all the way back in 1669. German alchemist Henning Brandt was convinced that gold could be distilled from liquid gold. And by that, I mean human pee. So he left 50 buckets of urine in his cellar to ferment for months. His family were thrilled. He then boiled and distilled it until he ended up with, yeah, not gold. But he did produce a white waxy substance that began to glow an eerie green and then spontaneously burst into flames. He had discovered phosphorus. Now, for the first time in history, humans had direct access to phosphorus and immediately we began resetting our relationship towards it. For better and worse. For a start, it led to this, fossy jaw. But this grim side effect of being exposed to white phosphorus also sparked the very first British trade unions. All right, let's row back a sec because that whole spontaneous combustion thing, well, that made phosphorus ideal for a 19th century game changer, matches. A French chemist decided to add white phosphorus to the mix of chemicals on the end of a match because phosphorus is just so flammable. So you could strike your lucifer match, as they were appropriately called, on any hard surface. Suddenly, everyone had cheap fire at their fingertips. But in the match factories, something immediately started to go wrong. You might develop phosphorus necrosis the matchwoman called it Fossy Jaw. 
because the phosphorus took hold of your jawbone and started to decay it while you were still alive. So you'd be spitting out bits of your own skeleton, bits of bone the size of peas through vile smelling abscesses in your face. Now, for some reason, the match women weren't so fond of this situation. So in the summer of 1888, they go on strike. 1,400 of them. This leads to a wave of other strikes. It's the formation of the modern trade union movement as we know it today. And that, of course, eventually leads to proper health and safety legislation, factory inspectors, and the banning of white phosphorus in match production throughout Britain. So there you go. Phosphorus, not great for the jaw, pretty good for labour rights. And what did we do with all the white phosphorus? Yeah, we chucked it on all our food. Well, on the crops, which we then later eat. One of many good reasons to avoid drinking fertilizer. But it seems a good time to go back to the fertilizer part of this story, because it's time to welcome the next protagonist. Nope, not that guy, this. See, in the 18th and 19th century, famine hit Europe. Why? Because we didn't have enough phosphorus. Two major historical developments played a big part in this. Phosphorus had always been part of a closed loop cycle. Humans and animals lived right next to the plants they grew, keeping all the phosphorus nearby. But the rise of huge rural to urban migration meant that people were taking their precious phosphorus rich poo with them. To make matters worse, although not so much for the people actually living there, then came the sanitation revolution and started to flush it all away for good. Suddenly, this neat little closed loop had been broken wide open. So we needed a new source of phosphorus and it came in the form of bird poo. Guano was discovered, which is bird and bat droppings, um, which were found off the coast of Peru and in the South Pacific in abundance. Guano is so rich in nutrients like phosphates and nitrogen that it makes for an extraordinary fertilizer. And the Western world goes wild. I can't stress this enough for bird poo. Welcome to Guano Mania. Peru, in debt to the UK for financing their independence from Spain, signs a trade deal giving the UK a virtual monopoly on their guano. The US gets jealous and passes an act allowing their citizens to take possession of any unclaimed islands with guano. And Spain seizes Peru's guano-rich Chincha Islands before they're forced out again. Eventually, though, it became uneconomic to mine guano. So, leaving a huge trail of environmental and social devastation in its wake, the mob descends on a different phosphorus source, phosphate rock. It's used to fertilize fields all over the world. The result? From 1950 to 2000, the global population more than doubles. But just like with guano, now phosphate rock is also running out. And while some places don't have enough phosphorus, Others are getting too much. We're allowing it to go into our waters where it's making toxic algae grow um, and producing these huge green sludgy algal blooms which kill everything within the lake and everything that wants to drink from the water around there. See, it's a bit of a Goldilocks situation with phosphorus. Everything needs to be just right. Imagine for a second a boat full of phosphorus. Just one tiny bit more and the boat flips and you go from biodiverse to algal bloom. Many lakes uh, around the planet are getting really close to this tipping point. And as soon as you add that tiny bit more, bosh, you've got an algal bloom. Climate change uh, is making that, that level uh, for the tipping point uh, much lower. According to one study, phosphorus pollution affects almost 40% of the Earth's land. So the same thing we're desperately running out of is also being wasted and consequently polluting the planet. Amazing. And the fact that the remaining phosphorus is so unevenly distributed around the world, yeah, that doesn't help either. So while all farmers need access to phosphorus to produce food, just five countries currently control 85% of the world's remaining phosphate rock. And this makes it highly susceptible to wild fluctuations in the global price of phosphorus. In 2008, the price of phosphate rock spiked 800%. It devastated many vulnerable populations and caused riots and farmer suicides from India to Haiti. And what we're seeing right now is that the price of phosphate has spiked 400% more than it was two years ago. Clearly, something needs to change. 
So basically, if you flush your toilet, you are a really bad person. Okay, maybe not so much, but the main answer does come back to where it all started, poop. Only about 15% of the phosphorus in sewage is currently recovered around the world. We are relying on this resource, which is effectively boosting pollution of our, of our lakes and our rivers, uh, where we could uh, move to a circular economy for phosphorus everywhere and really empower uh, sewage recycling uh, and food waste recycling and grow our food uh, using the pollutant. One analysis found that recycling all manure could halve global demand for phosphate rock. Admittedly, that's easier said than done. But there are scientists and companies looking into how we can close back up this broken loop. So the race for solutions is definitely underway. The issue with phosphorus is if we don't do something about it now, the future that we leave our children and our grandchildren is looking bleak. It's a world where we can't produce enough food. It's a world where our rivers and our lakes are green and toxic. Um, the good news is we can do something to change that. And the benefits for that for farmers, for society and for the environment are brilliant. So we just need to get on with it and just do it now.